Hi, I'm Paula Stanislaus. My husband David and I are part of the pastoral care team at IES, and we're excited today to have the opportunity to worship with our IES family. Remember, the month of August is devoted to Romans chapter 8. Before we begin, let's pray. Lord, we invite your presence today. Would you speak to our hearts? And we pray that our lives would be changed because of what you say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. I know these feels like a merry-go-round We wanted to start, but it won't slow down But I never doubt a God is in control I know these feels like a valley so deep A shadow of death, I love us to sleep But I never doubt a God is in control He's got the hope In his hands But once we thought we got it all figured out Right away a new situation starts Once again we ask Who's really in control Oh! 
give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give up. You restore every heart that is broken. Greater you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you. darkness you give hope you restore every heart that is broken great are you Lord it's your breath in our lungs so we pour Lift up our hands. Say, great are you. Come worship him, church. Let's worship him with all our heart. For great and mighty is our God. Yes. And all the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry. These bones will sing. Great. Shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. Yes, all the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great
mighty God worthy of praise now and forevermore oh great and mighty God mm. let's look to the Lord in prayer and we're going to do our prayer time in two separate sections today uh, the first is our normal prayers and then uh, we're going to sing a song, a, a, an Indonesian song, and we're going to pray for the country because of the uh, Tujulbas Agustus that will be coming very soon. Our first prayer is for the unspoken prayer request. For those of you who have something that you're facing or your family member or something like that, I want you to just click on that unspoken prayer and, and you're offering that need up to the Lord and we're praying along with you, even though we don't know what it is or even who you are. The second thing we're going to be praying for our IES family, uh, on behalf of my wife and I and our whole church, we want to express our condolences to, to uh, attorney Kim Silaban. He, he, he lost his wife, Michelle. Michelle Tabunan is very well known to us in the church, and uh, she's been an active part of IES. She's taught classes. She's participated in outreach and so many things. And she had a sudden medical emergency, and... Um, she went to be with the Lord. And so our condolences are with her whole family. We're, we're thankful that we know that she's with the Lord. But it's a real loss, a real sudden loss for the family. We're also going to pray for the other members of our congregation. Pastor Allen, uh, we continue to pray for his ongoing treatment. It, the response is going very well, but the uh, treatment still has a number of phases to go. And so we lift him up for that. And I want a special prayer from all of you for Ibu Mariana for some needs that she has in her family. Her daughter, Jamima, who lives in Perth, is going to school in Perth, is facing a medical situation. And she really needs uh, Ibu Mariana to go there. And it's a really complicated time because of COVID and lack of flights and things like that. Uh, so we really need to pray that the Lord would just open up the right door. She was able to get the right kind of visas and things like that. It's just a transportation issue. And we just need to get her from Jakarta to Perth. Uh, and then we also need to pray for uh, Ibu Mariana's uh, granddaughter, Sophia. Sophia is uh, facing a, a real medical issue, and the doctors have not yet been able to find a way out of it. And uh, we just want to pray that a miracle would happen for her. We're going to also pray for, uh, in this stage of the prayer, for, um, for those people who are being generous. And uh, we have a pattern in IES. It's happened over and over and over. The Lord lays on somebody's heart to give generously. And then we face some kind of a financial uh, opportunity where we have finances, we can do something. This happened with the tsunami. It happened with the earthquake in Jogja. It, it happened with the uh, earthquake in Nias. It's happened many, many, many different times. And we believe that we're seeing something like that again. And so we just want to encourage those people who are gen practicing generosity to continue to practice that because we believe that the Lord is preparing us to be able to do something. Certainly, in this crisis, when many churches were really, really struggling, the Lord prepared us to be able to help. We, we, we feed some, somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 different families uh, with, with uh, Simbaco, and we're helping uh, somewhere almost 2,000 pastors in the gay SGI. And we're going to have to raise up the level of our help in the coming weeks and coming months the rest of the year because they're really suffering. So let's look to the Lord in all of these things. Let's bring our, our hearts together and, and come before him in prayer. Father, first of all, Lord, we pray for those people who have unspoken requests. No matter what platform they're on, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. You see their needs. You see the situation of their hearts and lives. We just pray right now in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would, that you would answer their prayers and that they would rejoice because they know that you've heard and answered their prayers. Father, we just pray for Kim and, and for all of Michelle's family, Lord. We pray our, our prayers of comfort, Lord. You are the God of all comfort, and we pray that you would be with him and with other family members on this very shocking and very surprised loss, Father. We just lift them up to you. Lord, I lift up Pastor Allen to you, Lord. I pray that you would just continue to do a healing work in his body. And as he continues all through the medical things, Lord, we know that ultimately, Lord, it is your hand that is bringing healing to him, and we thank you for that. Father, for, for Ibu Mariana, Lord, we pray first of all for Jemima in, in Perth, we pray that you would touch her and minister to her and strengthen her. And then we pray that you would open up the right door for Mima to go from Jakarta to Perth, Lord. Uh, the complication is, is very, very severe. Uh, we know she'll have to spend quarantine time, Lord. But we pray that you would open the door that she would be able to go soon. And Father, we pray for Sophia. We just ask in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would touch her and just bring healing to her. Lord, we don't need to know what is causing the problem, but we need to know that you have touched her and, and healed her and brought deliverance to her, Lord. 
Father, I just lift up to you and I thank you for all the people in IES who have been so generous in so many different ways. We thank you for them, Lord. So many different kinds of generosity have been expressed through volunteers, through people doing different things. But Lord, we've also experienced the generosity of those people that you have spoken to and they have responded, Lord, and they've been generous with their assets, with the things that they have. We face certain challenges now, Lord, uh, increasing the support for the pastors as other partners are not able to help out anymore and the different kinds of needs that we're facing and different people are facing, Lord. I just lift up to you each and every one who has been generous. I pray that you would minister to them. I pray that you would uh, encourage them in their generosity, Lord, to know that, that, that you have called upon them, that you have given them things in order that they might be a conduit, Father. I pray that you would just bless those who have been generous and that they would continue in their generosity in the days to come. We thank you and praise you for all of these things, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray for Indonesia together. Father, we thank you for this country. We thank you for the plan and purpose that you have for this country. We thank you for the, the history of this country who has, 
who has given us a place where we can worship you and we can follow you. We can lift up prayers to you. And so we bring our, we bring our prayers together. We thank you, Lord, for this place. We pray that you would be with Indonesia, that you would bless Indonesia from the very top of government structure, Lord. We pray for all of the government leaders. We pray for the president of Indonesia, Lord. We pray for the government leaders. We pray that you would give them wisdom. We pray that you would give them strength, not just in the national government, Lord, but all of the different areas where we are in this place now, your people, Lord. We pray that you would just uh, speak to the hearts and give wisdom to those regional leaders, Lord. We pray not only for political leaders, Lord, but we pray for leaders in, in, the, in, in the government structures, Lord. We pray uh, for people who are, who are handling different kinds of ministries. We pray for leaders in the police and in the military. We pray for leaders in the civil service. Lord, in these challenging times, give them wisdom, give them understanding, give them different ways that they can see different ways to help people's lives. All the way down in the government structure, Lord, to the lowest local level where they're, where they're responsible to help out the people in their neighborhoods, Lord. We pray that you would give them wisdom in all of these things. Father, we pray for society. We pray for the, the people in the business community and the scientific community and the professional communities. We pray for the caregivers, the doctors, the nurses, Lord, and all the different kinds of care levels that different givers at different levels. Be with them, Lord. Protect them. For those who are uh, working in medically, Lord, we, we pray especially that you would protect them. Give them, uh, give them wisdom and strength in handling the needs of this emergency and protect them also, Lord. We pray that you would bring them health and strength. Lord, we lift up the churches to you in Indonesia, Lord. May all of the churches, Lord, IES and every other church, Lord, we pray that our hearts together would be in, in filled with your Holy Spirit and we would continue to uh, serve you and we would continue to proclaim your name with wisdom. Father, we lift up Indonesia to you. We know that you have a plan for this country. We know that you have a purpose for this country and we know that we as your church are very much involved in that. And it's our responsibility, Lord, to, to fulfill what you want us to do. And so we commit ourselves to that, Lord. We lift up Indonesia and we also commit ourselves towards Indonesia, Lord, that we would fulfill your purpose in this country. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, now one of the things I really like about a series is because I know that not everybody watches uh, every, every week, and so it's a way to remind people of certain things. Now I also know if the sermon goes too long, you're gonna stop watching. Once I, I preached from the book of Acts for 12 months, and at the end of 12 months, people said, yeah, we're tired of the book of Acts, Pastor Dave, so I won't do that again. But I wanna remind you of the things that we discovered in the first two weeks, this is the third week of our Romans 8 series. Uh, last week, if we want to remember what we learned, we learned that there are really two basic ways, uh, two realms of living in this life. It's not, it's not the flesh and the spirit, like in human beings, our fleshly side, our bad side is fighting against our spiritual side, our wonderful side, and, and we see how that's going. That's not like that at all. There's two different ways of life, and this is going to come out a little bit more today. There's two different ways of this life. It's the one way is the way of the flesh, the way of Adam as descendants of Adam, and the second way is the, the way of God's Holy Spirit following the ways of Christ. Now, this is really, really interesting. Last week, I watched a, a video from the Bible Project. If you have you version, you should go for plans and pick some of those uh, Bible Project the devotionals because they give us these great videos. And this video reminded us of something that, that I know and you probably know, but we need to keep it reminded to ourselves. We think of Adam as a name, right? Adam was this guy and his wife was Eve. But the Bible Project pointed out to us, Adam actually is a word that means man or mankind or even human. And what the word of God is really saying is there's a human way and then there's God's way. We can choose the human way, the way that Adam did it and all the other people did it. And, and, and as Christians, we choose that direction and we can receive forgiveness. But we better would be to choose the way of following Jesus, the way of the Messiah, the way of the Son of God. And so if you choose the way of Adam, seeking your own way and doing your own life, are you going to choose that way as a, as a, as a believer? Or are you going to choose following the way of Christ? 
living to please and love God. And I ask you for commitments about that. In fact, I talked about something I call spiritual arbitrage, which is something I think a lot of believers do. A lot of people have told me since those two weeks, you know, Pastor Dave, I, I know that I'm guilty of that, which is the idea of just being good enough to be on God's good side, or some people would understand, just good enough to get to heaven. But wanting to do things that are bad, but we want to make sure they're not too bad so we don't kind of lose that. Uh, you know, I, I, I heard this saying one time, I don't know where it came from, but it said that people in the modern world, uh, they, they hope that they'll get to heaven and that they pray that there is no hell. And that's kind of what spiritual arbitrage means. Now, last week we ended on a really interesting note. It was a really great uh, lesson. We understood some things. And in verse 17, leading into what we're going to do today, it says, since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. Now, that's terrific. And then it says, but if we're to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Oh, that doesn't sound though so good. So we recognize that the wonder of what we are doing, the wonder of what God has for us, the wonder of what it means to be his children also includes when we share in that relationship with Jesus, it also includes that that means we're also sharing in with his difficulties. That the part of being a true disciple brings us into the world that hated him and brings difficulties with us. All right, so let's, let's talk about that aspect a little bit. What about the difficulties? Some of you might have ended the lesson last week or the sermon last week by asking the question, hey, why doesn't God just make it really easy for us? Once we follow him, he should just take all the troubles away from us. And, and I've heard people kind of argue that. They've kind of said, you know, Pastor Dave, it would be better if once we get to know Jesus, he just sends us straight to heaven or something like that. Uh, I'm not sure if we would really want that, but they would say something about it. Why can't he just make everything work well for us? Let's get a different perspective on this, perhaps, than we've ever had before. It's been hiding out in the book of Romans, but we haven't really paid attention to it. All right, so let's read together. I want you to read out loud with me. It's an act of worship to read the word of God out loud. So let's read together. This is Romans 8, 18 to 25. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. And against his will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believe, and we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies that he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already had something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't have yet, we wait patiently and confidently. All right, let's break this down and let's check through this. Now, one of the sources I, I, I turn to a lot is a guy named Craig Keener. Craig's actually uh, 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 been to Indonesia a few times and spoken on different topics, a wonderful Bible scholar, wonderful historian. And according to him, during this period of time that Paul is talking in the first century, there's this time of, of great cosmic pessimism. Everybody thinks the world is going to pieces and everything is decaying and, and fate is dragging everything down. Everything is going to go, is, is worse and getting worse. Paul is saying something that would speak to the people of that time. And maybe some of you think that way here in the modern era. We have some people in our modern era who think that everything is getting better in the world, but that's pretty hard to swallow with what we see now. But Paul is saying, yes, in some ways, Things are getting worse in the cosmic sense, in the whole creation sense. And yet there's something going on that we need to understand. And so we're going to try and understand this together. Paul is going on to explain why is it that we inherit being his children, but we also need to be participating in suffering and hardships during this time. Why doesn't God just step in and, and take over everything? He's going to answer that issue, not just for us, but he's going to put it in context of all creation. God is, Paul is going to encourage us with what is coming ahead, even though some of what is coming 
is issues of, of suffering and things like that. Now, first of all, I want you to understand that Paul is going to express this kind of like in parallel. And I, I wish that I was standing in front of you because then I could use like my whole body for this thing and march around on the stage. But I want you to understand this whole idea of parallel. There's our lives, yeah, our, our walk of faith, and then there's what the whole creation is going through. And Paul is going to show us that they are not separate things. In fact, there's a, there is a, a unity between them, a parallel between them that can help us understand why we go through certain kinds of things. Paul is going to look at that. Now, the first principle of what we need to understand is that Paul says what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed to us and revealed for us. So the first thing that you need to understand is this. No matter what you're going through, and some of you who are listening are going through very difficult things. Some of you are going through heartbreak. Some of you are going through loss. Some of you are going through real struggles. And Paul wants to tell you to understand what God has in store for you is so much better than what you're going through that in the time to come, you won't even think about it anymore. It's not going to be like when you get to heaven, you're going to be able to say, oh, God, you know, I went through this, I went through this, I went through this, I went through this. Because when you get there, you'll realize there's no comparison. Verse 18 says, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us and he will reveal for us later. Okay, so this is what happens. We, we become a child of God and we become an heir of God. And along with that comes this promise of glory and, and promise of all these things, including suffering. And Paul is writing to these people over on this side, on this side of the parallel. Some of them are already facing. The Christians who live in Rome, even when Paul is writing this, have suffered different kinds of persecution already. Not some of the terrible things that were to come, but really already very difficult things. And then Paul says, all of God's creation, this other side over here, all of God's creation has also been subject to suffering. Another way of saying it is that it's not just you. You're not the only one who's going through suffering and hardships and trials. All of creation, in verse 19, all creation is waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. So what's the day of revelation? It's the day that God comes and reveals to this universe those who really are his children. That's us. And at some point, we will not just be expressing that we're followers of Christ, but God himself will display us as his children. This is why it's wonderful to read the book of Revelation, which some of us are reading now for our, our, our soap, because it talks about those days. Verse 20, it says, against its will, all creation was subject to God's curse, but with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Let me, let me, let me make sure that you understand this. This whole creation, this whole universe, not just this earth, is not what it should be. And, and the way Paul is talking about that is, is he's talking and saying that, that, that it's almost like the pains of childbirth as something that God is going to bring forward. And it's going to, God's going to bring it forward because of what has been destroyed by sin. The picture that you have over here is all of creation. And, the, and this is what God's doing in my life and your life is parallel. And all of creation is looking over here and peeking at what's going on and saying, when are, when are we going to finish with this? When is, when is God going to reveal everything? Now, as you look at the world around us, we can easily understand that the disasters all around us and things like that make it really clear that this is not the, the, the world that God created. When God created this wonderful creation, he said, it is good, 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 it is very good. And then he set back to look at everything that he had done. And we can look at the world around us and, and, and tell that it's not that way. Look at all the disasters that take place. You know the world was not created for disasters. It was created for beauty and graciousness, and balance, and all of those kinds of things. Let's take a look at sickness that goes on around us. COVID is an example of a world that's out of whack. COVID is a disease that came from an animal. It was, you know, people say, well, why did God let it happen? <laughs> COVID should have, the, the, the virus that causes COVID never should have jumped into the human stream. It's so amazing that we see this. We see MERS, we see SARS, we see Ebola. You know, a lot of people have all kinds of different kinds of things so they understand, but they need to understand that in the world that God created, none of this would have ever happened. It is because of the bad things that happens in the world. 
You know, one of the great ironies of this is that people have talked about uh, the present virus as being like the influenza, the flu virus. And of course, um, you know, viruses are, are different. Viruses are the same, but it's really interesting because most people in the world today, even though, even though flu kills a lot of people every year, most people really don't understand some of the things that are involved there. The word flu or influenza is a word that comes from a Latin word, a medieval Latin word that means influence. Because at one point, when you had the flu, they thought it was because the influence of the stars on your body. You think the viral, you know, you think that understanding of virus is a short change now. In the dark ages, they thought the virus was causing, not the virus, but the influence of the star. And that's why you have that influenza. The first influenza epidemic in the world started in 1580, almost 450 years ago. And it spread all over the world because the virus had jumped from an animal to human beings. The second terrible virus came around in 1743 and it spread from Italy up to England and the word flu came into the English language. Now the irony of all of this because the human population has gotten used to it to a certain degree. The irony of all of this is it almost certainly came from birds and it jumped from birds probably to pigs and then from pigs to humans 500 and something years ago. What is this a sign of? Flu, MERS, Ebola, SARS, COVID. It's a sign of a world that's out of whack, a world that's, that's wrong because of the presence of sin. And don't misunderstand me. God's project is to redeem this world and to redeem his people. I'm not saying that, that we have COVID-19 because people sinned, so they got covid I'm saying that the world that we're in has chosen its own way. And it's really understanding, it's really wonderful to understand that there's a day coming when God's true children will be revealed. And when that day comes, when the creator of all the universe does that, the creation will be made new once again, like it was during the time of Adam and Eve. So then we see in our own lives, we, we want to follow the way of humanity, the way of Adam, or we want to follow the way of the Messiah. It's the old way or the new way, and it's reflected in creation. The old creation fell. That's the way of Adam. And the new creation that is going to become is going to be made by God, where all of these things that we balanced out. There are wonderful things about creation. People tell me they, they see God in creation. And, and when you see a beautiful place, when you see a beautiful sunset, when you see a beautiful scene, you acknowledge the majesty and beauty and yet those things also bring death and destruction in many ways. You know, Bible scholars and theologians like to discuss how this is going to happen. And some people are convinced that this old discretion, this old creation is going to be destroyed and then a new creation, completely new one, is going to be made. And others say, no, 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 that's not what's going to happen. God is going to remake the creation and make it good. Folks, that's a good argument for theologians. That's a good argument for Bible scholars. It doesn't really matter. What matters to us is to understand this. All of God's creation will be redeemed at that point when God steps in and says, these are my children. The, all of creation is going to be redeemed, what Paul calls glorious freedom, freedom from sin. Now let's take a look again. In verse 23, it says, and we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us, as a foretaste, and another word there, the word I like to use in the NIV it uses is, is first fruit of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies that he has promised us. So here we are on this side, we're the humans. And we're all so eager for this to happen when God steps in and he gives us new bodies completely. And we're given this hope when we are saved because if we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. It's only those things that we hope for. So we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly as we eagerly await for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Okay, so let's go back to our, the, 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 let's go back to our parallel. Okay, here we have all of the people who have become the sons and daughters of God and we're, we're going through life and we're tempted to follow the human way. And, and sometimes we make a mistake. We're not talking about perfection here. But when we sin, we confess to God. He forgives us. We don't have a punishment. There's no condemnation. But we need to learn that with the Holy Spirit in us, we follow the, the way of following God. 
And then we have this parallel here of all creation who's watching us because it's through what he's doing in us that he's going to accomplish all of these things. Now, what it says to us is the Holy Spirit that we receive when we become Christ followers is the first proof, the first fruit of what is coming. What does that mean? Remember how we talked about that when we become the followers, we, we who are on this side, this personal side that God is doing, God gives his Holy Spirit to us and his spirit mixes together with our spirit and we have this relationship within us. That's what you mean when you say, I feel like God is saying to me. I hope that's what you mean. I hope you don't use that as a line that you just want to get what you want. But that's what that sense is. We're changed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in us and we grow in the Holy Spirit and we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit is a, a, a down payment, a certificate of something of what our eternity is going to look like when we're together with God all the time. Let me, let me use a paraphrase of an illustration that C.S. Lewis uses, and I really like this illustration. He talks about how God's Spirit works with us to change us, and that's what we're talking about, the role of the Spirit. And what he does is he uses this illustration. For those of you who had small children or work with small children, you'll understand this. And what he does is he talks about how, you know, when you have a small child and you want to teach them to write, they, 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 you know, they take the pen, they put it in their hand, and they can't do it. And then you put your hand on top of them. Let me... It's kind of awkward here. I, I have a right hand and a left hand, but you understand what I mean. You put your hand on top of them and you help them to do the things that they need to do. Help them to form the letters, the M's and the O's and the P's and the Q's and all of those things. And as they continue writing, they do it better and better and you're doing less and less influencing. And the time comes when you take your hand off and they're already changed. This is the promise that we have in the spirit. God's spirit lives with us. We hear his voice and his Holy Spirit helps us so that we don't choose the Adam way, the human way, but we choose the way of the Messiah, the second Adam, Jesus Christ. And we wait for that when the time comes to an end. And we wait with two important attitudes. We wait with the attitude of patience and we wait with the attitude of confidence. In verse 25, it says, if we look forward to something we don't have yet, we must wait patiently and confidentially, confidently, sorry. So what is patience? Patience is not allowing the events in life to overwhelm us. We're facing difficult times right now. We need to make sure that we are patient. In other words, God's plan and purpose will be unfolded. I, I know you and, and I know me. We all get frustrated sometimes and we ask ourselves the question, when is God going to step in? When is God going to change something? When is the miracle that we've prayed for? You know, we've, we've all prayed for this whole COVID thing to shut down. Those of us who are smart enough have prayed that the Lord would do it in his time. Those who are not so smart on TV have proclaimed when it's going to happen and breathed the virus out into the ocean and all that kind of stuff and, and been real failures. We do it with patience. We don't know why God hasn't acted yet, but we know that God will act. And that's what we're doing. Confidence means being sure of the ultimate outcome. So whatever we're facing, whenever we're facing we face suffering and hardship in this world because of what has happened. And as we face that hardship and suffering, we face it confidently and we face it with patience. So let's go through this again. I want to just reiterate, and then I'm going to challenge you to make some, uh, some commitments to the Lord. Why do we face suffering and hardship in this world? First of all, the whole of creation, including us, we're here, and all of creation is waiting for God to make things right. Creation is a mess. And we who have become God's children are still caught up in that mess. Our, we're in parallel here. We're a part of what's going on in the world. We're the good part. We're the yeast that's coming in to bring an end to all of this. Secondly, we know that there will come a time when God makes all things right and good. And we wait and look forward to that with confidence and patience. Even all of the created universe is going to be put right. The creation is messed up. And in what God is doing through us, he's going to put it right. While we wait for that time to come, we're given God's spirit to be in us and with us as a first fruit of what's to come. Do you want to know what it's like to be a child of God in eternity? What is it like to have the presence of the Holy Spirit in your heart? That is that taste that he has already given. You know, my wife was cooking some things, and, uh, and as she was cooking them, uh, she had done some things different, and she wanted to try a little bit different. And so she asked me to come over and, and we looked at it and everything. And she said, 
You want to try a taste? Now, I didn't want to try a taste because I thought I would just not eat anything at that moment. You know, um, eating things is an issue for me. So I have to try and find a little balance. But I wanted. And so she, she got a little spoonful of what she was cooking and she gave it to me. And as I was getting the spoon, I dropped a little bit off. And so I only had a little bit, a tiny bit on the spoon left. And so I took the spoon and I ate it. And it was just a tiny bit of this huge pot, but I had a taste of what was going to come. And I'm confident that everything in that pot is going to be excellent because that first little bite I had, the Holy Spirit present in our lives is that first little bite of what God is going to do. We endure, we grow, we overcome. And we become more and more and more God's true children through these trials that we face. You know, some people believe that these trials are given to us. This time is given to us so we can become more like him. And I, and I think that's really good. I, I want to read something from Craig Keener. I, 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 I quoted him earlier. I talked about some of the things he shared. I want to read this from Craig Keener. It's really, really good. And then we're gonna, I'm going to challenge you in some things. First fruits... That's the phrase that's used there. First fruits was the actual beginning, the first installment of the Palestinian harvest. The presence of the Spirit in the believers is thus the actual beginning of the future world. Believers had experienced redemption and adoption, but they still awaited the fullness of that experience at the resurrection of their bodies by the Spirit. The Israelites were redeemed from Egypt. And the consummation of their salvation was delayed a generation by their disobedience in the wilderness. It was nearly 40 years before they entered the promised land. And only two from that group was able to enter the promised land. Paul explains Christ's salvation in the same way because it's like a new exodus. The beginning and the completion of salvation are separated by the period of God's leading through the tests of the present age. Okay, we're going to be redeemed all creation is going to be redeemed. We're facing all of these tests. The beginning and completion of salvation are separated by the period of God's leading through the tests of this present age. I'm going to put some challenges before you. And I want you to think of some things that relate to what we've studied, not just today, but over the last three weeks. I want to challenge you in these three ways. The first challenge is this. I want you to ask yourself this question. I know that I must make right choices in this world because some of you are really struggling with right choices and some of you are acting like it doesn't matter, like I can do spiritual arbitrage. I can do a few things right and fewer things wrong. I want you to know that you need to make this decision. I know that I must make right choices in this world. I will follow the way of Jesus Christ. Some of you are following the way of Adam, the way of humanity, a lot more than you are following the way of Jesus. But the time has come for you to follow the way of Jesus. The second challenge that I want to give to you is this. I know that I will face hardship in this world. And this is important for you to understand. You will face hardship. By following Jesus, there will be challenges. For some of you, they will be mostly emotional or con uh, you know, changing your life. But for some of you, it'll come from the outside. But when faced with that, I want you to say, I will be patient and confident. I will be patient and confident in these trials. And finally, the third thing is I want you to say, I know God's spirit wants to live in and through me. And then I will be changed by him. I want you to think about these things. I want you to think of the one or maybe two that most easily applies to you. And as I pray, and I'm going to say a prayer, and then I'm going to lead into the prayer of benediction. And that's going to be the challenge for you to look at these things and make a commitment to change. Let's pray together. Father, I lift up each and every person who's out here watching, Lord, whenever, wherever they're watching, whatever it might be, that your Holy Spirit would speak to their hearts. Lord, I've laid these challenges before them and that they would make these commitments to live by you, to live for you, and to allow your Holy Spirit to live through them. I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to them and that they would respond and they would not just respond in the moment, but that they would continually respond and that they would continually uh, make a commitment to, to live by the response that they make. I'm going to pray a prayer benediction over all of you at this time. And now, my brothers and my sisters, I challenge you in the name of Jesus, who is our Lord and Savior that you will let the Holy Spirit live in your hearts and lives and that you will move forward with the life that he has provided for you. And in facing hardships and challenges, you will be faithful 
and you will be confident in him. Put your trust in him alone. Look to him as your savior and your redeemer. And I pray that the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and anointing of the Holy Spirit would be with you in Jesus' name, amen. Of his glory. 